this is a focus leader. Do you hear movies look like this? Do you hear soundtracks sound like this? Or like this? If so, you need this. A focus leader. First, set your lens so that these lines are sharp and clear on all parts of the screen. Now, set the volume control on your projector. The sound level should be adjusted until my voice can be clearly understood in all sections of the room. You are now ready to participate in another Pan American Travel Adventure. This story began one morning with the arrival of two letters. One for John Erickson, that's me with the mouthful of toast, and one for my wife, Mary, who was getting through that breakfast without burning the toast. Now, my letter was from my cousin Stig in Sweden, and Mary's was from her Aunt Clara in Norway, both urging us to visit them that summer. It seemed a strange coincidence until it occurred to me that Mary had plotted something behind my back. And then Mary said it. Why put it off? We'd planned a vacation that year, and flying Pan American Airways, we could be in Stockholm in less than 24 hours. Obviously, my wife had been investigating on her own, but I must admit the same idea had been running through my mind. I guess both our minds had been made up for months. When we first caught sight of the double-deck Pan American Clipper that we were to board, Mary said, well, we finally made it. This was to be her first flight, but she dreamed of it for so long that everything seemed quite familiar. We felt at home, too, in the solid comfort of the Clipper's interior. We settled down into wide, roomy seats, and our vacation had begun before we even took off. Once in the air, I flipped open Pan American's guidebook to the world. I stretched out in that man-sized sleeperette seat and began to dream up the final touches to the three-part vacation that we'd planned. Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Just about the time we were feeling hungry, our stewardess turned up with a steak dinner prepared by Maxime's of Paris and served sizzling hot from the Clipper's kitchen. Even Mary had to admit that she couldn't have done better. And to prove that we were really on vacation, a glass of vintage champagne. Downstairs in the double-decker's lounge, we spent the last part of the evening chatting with our fellow passengers comparing itineraries and boasting just a little about our own plans. And here, Mary remarked that PAA had even provided a substitute for my midnight trip to the icebox. We lingered over that last little midnight snack, while on the upper deck, our steward was making up the wide, bed-sized berths in which we would spend the night. After a good night's sleep, we changed at London to Pan American Special Scandinavian Flight. And before we knew it, we were over Stockholm. Traveling any other way, our whole trip would have taken more than a week of our vacation. But we had flown to the capital of Sweden in less than 24 hours. This was the first time we'd ever seen Stockholm. 
And as our plane started in for a landing, I could tell that Mary was getting more excited every minute. My cousins, Stig and Ingrid Svensson, were to meet us at the airport. And Mary, her eyes glued to the window, kept saying, Look, there they are. I think I see them. And there they were. The Spensons had been urging us to make this trip for years, and now, well, I could hardly believe we were really there. It was just a year since the Spensons had visited us in America, and Ingrid and I had talked about this trip. I didn't think there was a chance of it then, but now Ingrid whispered in my ear, you see, John's not so stubborn after all. Ingrid and I were off on a shopping tour early the next morning. And there was Stockholm, exactly as I'd expected it, bristling with two wheelers. We'd arranged to meet John and Stig at lunchtime on the observation platform of the Katarina Tower. But by the time we finished our shopping and dodged through the noonday traffic, we were out of breath and at least half an hour late for our appointment. I could just imagine John up there getting hungrier and madder by the minute and grumbling to himself the way he does whenever I'm late. Women, women, he complains. They never seem to worry about the time. As it turned out, the view from the tower was so magnificent that the men hadn't even noticed how late we were. To my surprise, there were no complaints at all. Now I saw for the first time the breathtaking color and beauty that the Pan American folder described. The city stretched out beneath us like, quote, some incredible sparkling jewel, unquote. If ever there was a perfect setting for a restaurant, here it was, right on top of a tower high above the city. While we were waiting for lunch, I couldn't resist showing off the beautiful Swedish glass that I'd bought that morning. And of course, I had to boast about the money I'd saved. Then lunch was served, and I forgot all about my shopping and the beautiful view and everything but that wonderful smorgasbord. John's supposed to be the big eater in our family. I'm the one who watches my waistline. But after one look at that assortment of food, I'm afraid I forgot about it. Cold meats and fish, salads and cheese, and that was only a starter. After lunch that day, Mary and I walked along the water's edge to the town hall, famous for its blend of modern simplicity with traditional elegance. That was a combination that we came to expect as we got to know Stockholm better. Everything modern and up-to-date but always with a sort of blend of tradition and grace, the warmth and beauty of the old world. Take the ceramic shop that we visited. Here, every design is carefully applied by the artist's brush. Everything is shaped by hand and by the centuries of tradition that go to make the craftsman skill. The result is the world's most beautiful modern pottery and one more addition to the Ericsson collection. I must admit, it was hard to resist. The same traditional skill goes into Swedish glassmaking, and their glass, of course, is world famous. Having bought some for ourselves, we were particularly interested in a demonstration of the ancient hand-blowing techniques. I was doubly impressed with the skill that goes into this when I got a chance to handle the blowing tube myself. For some reason, I always think these things are going to be easy. And it always ends with Mary saying, she told me so. In Stockholm, you get the impression that everyone owns a bicycle and everyone owns a boat. The Svensons had promised to finish off our visit with a tour of the city in their sailboat. And that's how we spent our last afternoon with them. You see, Stockholm is a city surrounded by water. The Venice of the North, they call it. 
but here the water is clear and swiftly flowing, and nearly everyone does have a boat of one sort or another. Sailing through the heart of Stockholm was a wonderful way to spend our last day there. A wonderful way to say goodbye to the landmarks that we had come to love in our short stay. But we were determined to see all that we could. And our next stop was Visby on the island of Gotland, the great trading center of Northern Europe in the Middle Ages. A fact that you'd never guess from the modern steamer that brought us there or the luxurious resort hotel that we stayed at, one of the most famous in all Scandinavia. And there was certainly nothing medieval about the hotel swimming pool or the lovely scenery that surrounded it. Just to be friendly, I struck up several acquaintances around the pool, but somehow that didn't impress Mary very favorably. Well, Mary's the one who always says that we should try to meet friends when we travel. Mary likes the Roomba too, but she didn't seem to be in the mood for it that day. I got a kick out of this unexpected touch of the Latin so far north but I had a feeling that Mary was a little impatient about something. Well, there were so many other things to see at Bisbee. The hotel and the swimming pool were very fine, but even John had to admit that what we carried away from Bisbee was a sense of the past. Our tour of the island was almost like riding back into history, and of all the things we saw, I think we remembered most these skeleton arches still tracing the beauty of a towering Gothic nave that stood there eight centuries ago. Not quite so old, but still holding memories of the past, was this country church in Dalakalia, the heart of Sweden, where Midsummer Night is celebrated every year as it has been since the days of the Vikings. And John was very insistent about not missing this festival. Well, this was something I'd heard about from my family ever since I was a child. Something I'd always dreamed of seeing. You can imagine how it felt to be there at last. To see it with my own eyes, just as I'd always pictured it, only better. First, the villagers coming to church from across the lake in the traditional longboats. Echoes of the ancient Viking ships. Dressed in the intricately embroidered costumes that were everyday wear for their ancestors, the women and children braided garlands of flowers for this celebration that is close in spirit to our own May Day. The sound of the fiddlers tuning up served as background for the ceremonious raising of the Maypole, symbol of the Swedish Midsummer Night Festival. Finally, the moment we've been waiting for, the fiddler struck up dance rhythms, melodies handed down from generation to generation. And though we hadn't meant to do any dancing ourselves, we ended by joining in with the rest. Frankly, after all that exercise, it was good to get onto a nice, comfortable train and rest my aching muscles. 
we knew that we were getting pretty far north now, and then that whistle told us that we were crossing the Arctic Circle. It was quite an occasion for both of us. We'd never been that far north before. And right on top of that, our first herd of reindeer. We were in Lapland now, and these colorful clothes were not put on for a special occasion. That was daily dress for these deer-herding nomads of the north. Mary and I were lucky enough to visit a Lap settlement and see something of life in the northern tip of Sweden. This grass had been put out to dry and will serve as insulation in the family's boots during the winter to come. We learned that the Lap hut is only a part-time home, for the deer must be followed in their search for grazing land. And that explains something that reminded Mary of our American Indians. This mother with her portable bassinet This young man playing a game with his sister reminded us of an American youngster playing cowboy. But here the boy's game is also serious practice for the work that he must do when he grows older. The yearly roundup is the high point of life in Lapland, just as it is on our own western ranges. For reindeer mean everything to the Lap, food, clothing, and livelihood. His deer herd represents his life savings, and when it comes to herding it into the corral, even the youngsters must play their part. Traveling across from Sweden to Norway, Mary and I saw the midnight sun as we'll always remember it, setting and then rising again without ever quite touching the horizon. And then that wonderful steamer trip down the Norwegian coast to Bergen. Snow-capped peaks and glaciers made us realize for the first time the magnificent variety of a Scandinavian vacation. Of course, I had my own reasons for being excited during that trip. I knew that my Aunt Clara and Uncle Eric would be waiting for us when we landed at Bergen. We'd never seen each other, except in snapshots, but the Hansons knew us the minute we came down the gangplank, and we knew them. It seemed almost like a homecoming. Seen from the surrounding hills, Bergen is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. This is Norway's second largest city, a great seaport, where every street breathes a memory of sailing men of the past. Aunt Clara had planned a dinner party to welcome us on our first day, served, as is the custom here, at 4.30 in the afternoon. And I'm afraid that John wasn't quite prepared for all the formalities of a big Norwegian dinner. <clears throat> I want to welcome family, our guests from America, to tell them how happy we are to see them at last. We have looked forward to this <clears throat> many years. Now, welcome to our table. Welcome to booths. Skål! 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 John wasn't prepared for this, either. <coughs> but he soon got used to it. We were a little sad to leave Bergen and the Hansons behind us, but ahead of us stretched the Hardanger Fjord, perhaps the most majestic of those twisting waterways that indent Norway's coast. Of course, we had always thought of Norway as a country of great scenery, but you can never really know what that means until you experience the silent drama that surrounds you in the heart of the fjord. To break that silence, the fjord is punctuated here and there with a thunder of falling water plunging down over its rocky ledges. 
The best thing of all was to explore the fjord on our own, poking around until we discovered something wonderful and unexpected. Beneath the white snow of Hardanger's apple blossoms, we saw mountain farmers coaxing every inch of tillable ground into service. Not far from the carved steeple of a little country church, we came upon a group of brightly dressed school children rehearsing the measured steps of the region's folk dances. On the slopes of the Hardanger, we seemed to be surrounded by perpetual springtime. Every field was an invitation to stop and stay a little while. Even in the fjord, that was the time of year for weddings, and we were invited to one of these mountain ceremonies. This wedding meant a great deal to me. My own mother had been married in just such a ceremony at a little church in the Hardanger Fjord. I even remembered her description of the elaborate headdress that's still worn by the mountain brides. And afterwards, everyone lined up for a group picture, just like the one we have in our album at home. Mary would have been happy to spend the rest of our vacation in the Hardanger, but we'd already discovered that in Norway, every new thing is just as breathtaking as the last. So on we went, up into the snowy mountains, into ski country. Skiing was born in Norway, and nearly every Norwegian seems to have a pair of skis, whether he's a professional or just a lover of the sport out for a little fun. And with snow that never seems to melt, skiing here might almost be called a year-round activity. On our first night at the lodge, we saw movies of the annual winter contest at the famous Holman Kolen Ski Jump, an event that draws 100,000 Norwegian ski enthusiasts to witness their favorite sport. It seemed to us that those soaring bird-like flights were just as spectacular as any of the scenery that we'd witnessed in this remarkable country. Holmenkollen is the world's most famous ski jump, and naturally it was chosen as the site for the greatest sporting event of the 1952 Winter Olympic Games. Holmenkollen is situated just above Oslo Fjord, and it was from near there that we had our first bird's eye view of Oslo, set like a crown at the head of the fjord. Here in the capital, the young folk celebrated Norway's Independence Day with a spirit that reminded us a little of our own 4th of July. Young and old turn out for the parade, and the streets are filled with the wonderful sound of band music and marching feet. Everyone in Oslo takes this day off, even the prime minister and the royal family. When things had quieted down a little, we got a chance to see the city itself, where such striking buildings as the town hall express an adventurous spirit. A spirit as old as this Viking ship preserved in a museum. And beside a fountain in one of the city's parks, we found a present-day Viking who had substituted ingenuity for a ship of his own. 
Our last memory of Norway is a walk we took at sunset along Oslo's waterfront. And already our thoughts were beginning to turn to the next stage of our trip, across the water to Denmark. We knew that we hadn't seen all of Scandinavia until we'd seen Denmark's charm and gaiety. And because we'd flown Pan American, we had time for everything. To begin with, Kronborg, the famous castle of Elsinore, almost 400 years old, which Shakespeare used as the setting for his masterpiece, Hamlet. Each summer, that great drama is reenacted beneath the castle's ancient battlements by a famous international cast. From Kronborg, we travel down to Copenhagen, where the harbor is watched over by a figure from Hans Christian Andersen's immortal legend, The Little Mermaid. Before long, we knew why Copenhagen is noted for its towers and steeples. Mary has only one word for a city like this. She just says, isn't it wonderful? And of course, she's always right. Copenhagen must hold the world's record for bicycles. Even the chimney sweep travels on wheels. And after a while, we took to it ourselves. And this, incidentally, is not a firebox, as we thought at first. Well, as Mary kept insisting, it was a wonderful town, perhaps the most alive and colorful that we'd ever seen. Copenhagen is another water-bound, sea-going city. And down by the wharves, a granite statue pays tribute to the town's paper-hatted fishwives. Out on a tour of the city, we came across a restaurant that offered, now you won't believe this, 172 different kinds of sandwiches. Chopped beef with caviar and salmon, roast pigeon with mushrooms, poached egg with lobster, salami and egg yolk, veal and cucumber salad, 172, including a simple ham on rye. Mary decided that Copenhagen is called the Paris of the North because it's such a wonderful place for shopping. And I was particularly fascinated by the signs that hung over the shops. The oculist, the barber, a seafood restaurant, the winemaker, Glove maker, glass maker, hat maker, boot maker, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and something for the brand new baby under the sign of the stork. This is a land of storks, as we discovered once we got into the Danish countryside. Somehow that part of the country reminded us both of childhood. And we guessed the reason when we came upon this house with youngsters playing at the doorstep. The home of Hans Christian Andersen, Denmark's great spinner of tales for the young and the young in heart. From then on, it was like turning the pages of a beautiful old-fashioned picture book, sailing back into a wonderful legendary world. This part of Denmark would have been called fairy tale country even if Anderson had never lived to make it immortal. Denmark's bathing resorts also had something of the old world about them. Although our hotel at Fano was modern enough, before breakfast on our first morning there, we went down to the beach to discover the old-fashioned Victorian bathing machine, a sort of bathhouse on wheels. After you've changed into your suit, a fellow with a horse draws you right down into the water. A fairly bumpy ride, but Mary just couldn't resist service like that. And it was worth it in the end, as I had already discovered the water was perfect, even that early in the morning. Of 
course, not all of the beaches are so quiet and uncrowded. Here you'll find whatever kind of water sport you want. For the Danes love the sun and water, and Denmark's seacoast is famous for its variety. We spent the last days of our vacation touring the country's golden outer rim of beaches, and then back for a last glimpse of Copenhagen at night. The flashing lights of Tivoli Park, the gayest and most elaborate amusement park in all of Europe. We even had time for a performance at the ballet on that last wonderful night. And then something a little more lively. A toast to Scandinavia's brightness and sparkle. A toast to our Pan American flight and a promise to fly again to the gleaming lights of Viking land.